Welcome everyone to Aging in Action. And today we're so happy to have as our guest, Melanie Hibbert. And Melanie is the Executive Director with DriftCan. Welcome, Melanie. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So Melanie, tell us a bit about yourself and tell us a bit about what is DriftCan? Okay. Um, so DriftCan is the Diabetes Research Institute Foundation Canada. I did not come up with the name but hence the Drift Can <laughs> that we use. Um, and Drift Can was established um, in 2005. And our mission is to accelerate the cure for diabetes um, by directly funding cure-based diabetes researcher, Dr. James Shapiro and his team here at the University of Alberta. All funds that we raise go directly to cure-based research. Um, we know that it's important for people who live with diabetes to have treatments and technology and innovation that comes all the time, but it's come to a point where um, enough is enough and we need to find the cure. Um, there are over 450 million people around the world with a form of diabetes. Approximately 10% of them, so 45 million, live with type 1 diabetes. And in Canada, we have just over 300,000 people who live with type 1 diabetes. Um, and this is near and dear to me because out of that 300,000, two are mine. So um, this is why I'm involved with DRIFCAN. Uh, for years I volunteered um, and then this opportunity came when I met Dr. Shapiro to be the executive director for this organization. So my children are 21 and 17. Uh, my 21 year old was diagnosed at the age of four. Um, no history in our family of diabetes. So when the pediatrician took a moment and said, life as you know it has changed forever, your child has type one diabetes, he was not kidding. Um, at the time I had a three month old and begged them to please tell me that this would not happen again. And they said, nope, the odds of having multiples is very low. Um, fast forward 15 months later and my 18 month old was diagnosed. Wow. Um, each diagnosis wow. takes three to four days at our children's hospital to just teach us how to manage the diabetes um, and very different to have a four-year-old or an 18-month-old to manage the disease. So we did have to do the full training. Um, but they live a very healthy, happy life. But that is not without its challenges. And it is a 24-hour a day, seven day a week, 365 day disease that is invisible. So to society, it does not look like it's a bad disease, but they make it look that way because they work really hard to stay healthy. Mm -hmm. um, and it is a growing pandemic globally. Every three minutes, another Canadian is diagnosed with diabetes. 29% of the population of our country has a form of diabetes. Wow. This is something we need to cure. The cost, to, <laughs> the cost to our healthcare system is $14 billion a year. Yeah, and it's not because of the cost of the disease of having technologies and having ways to treat it. These are repercussions from unmanaged diabetes by no fault of anyone because it's not a perfect disease. And the healthcare system has a pull because these people end up in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And so not just for the people who live with the disease, but for our healthcare system, it would be substantial to have a cure. Well, when I told you my husband is type two and he has been for probably 10, maybe more than 10 years now. And he really didn't have an understanding, really. I kept telling him about carbohydrates and proteins and all of that, but until he got the, that sensor he has on his arm, that sort of was an aha moment for him. So, you know, he, he is better educated now, but it's still, he still struggles with it. And so he oh, used the freestyle Libre. Yes, yeah, yeah. 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 So that, that was a life changer for him because it gave him a better understanding of how food affects your body. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's pretty difficult having two children with that for sure. And, and life would be much easier if, if it didn't exist at all. And, and so the, the research that Dr. Shapiro is doing um, I mean, I saw, you know, something on TV about him and I thought, wow, is it possible? Is it within it our reach about the cure for diabetes? It is. So Dr. Shapiro has been um, in diabetes research since the middle of 1990s. In 1999, the Edmonton Protocol um, 
came out and what that was was the islet cell transplants and so they were transplanting in what we would call brittle diabetics meaning type ones who were not feeling their lows um, they were critical um, and so they use um, donor uh, pancreases to extract islet cells and then transplant them in people um, it was a trial in alberta for um, 15 years and in 2013 the Alberta government realized that it no longer was a trial it needed to be a treatment so if you live in the province of Alberta um, if you lived in Canada you could come here and live here for a year and you could have the transplant um, but in 2013 the Alberta government realized that it was it's a $75,000 um, transplant they closed borders so we call it the Alberta advantage if you live in Alberta you can have the transplant and our Alberta government pays for the transplant. Oh, I didn't um, know that. Yeah, but if you live anywhere else, um, BC is now starting to do it and Quebec is now starting to do it. There have been over 600 islet transplants in Edmonton by Dr. Shapiro and his team, but there are 30 sites around the world that have done over 3,000 islet transplants and all of those sites have sent their researchers to Edmonton and Dr. Shapiro and his team have trained every one of those sites on how to do those transplants. So this is, that is a remarkable um, transplant, remarkable research. However, it's not the cure because you replace insulin with anti-rejection drugs. And so nothing, if you replace one with another can be a cure, but it is life-changing for those patients. Then he moved into stem cell transplants. And in 2015, he did his first human trial of a stem cell transplant, which is partnership with Biocyte, which is a bio hub in San Diego. And they provide him with embryonic stem cells. And they take, for lack of a better word, a little tea bag, they put it under the skin, they inject the embryonic stem cells, and they produce and become insulin, uh, insulin producing cells in their body. Sadly, because it's a donated product, it's embryonic, it's not your own, those people also require anti-rejection drugs, hence not a cure yet. But they are still working on both of those human trials. Um, fast forward to um, a couple years ago when Dr. Shapiro decided enough is enough, it's only going to work as a cure if we use our own cells. So rather than, he collaborates with other researchers and other centers, rather than do it someplace else, he established the lab here in Edmonton at the Alberta um, Diabetes Institute at the U of A. And now the biggest thing is he's got mice, he's got a small little lab, he's got one researcher working on it, but in order to take it from where it is today to where it needs to go to human trials, he will need to cure approximately 2,000 mice by doing this. Um, and the facility that he needs to do requires more equipment, more items in order to make this go. But as of right now, he has cured six mice of diabetes by doing this process, by taking skin cells, cleaning them, reversing them, and making them into insulin producing cells. And that's, that's what DriftCan is very involved in right now and funding, is to get that lab up and running so that he can move from six mice to 2,000 to human trials. And, and I, heading to 2022, what, what is that? So DriftCan um, launched an initiative in um, April of 2020 and heading to 2022 is help eliminate all diabetes um, and 2022 was selected because in 1922 the first patient was successfully injected with insulin and survived. It was a 14 year old boy in Ontario. Um, Banting and Best discovered insulin in 1921 and in 1922, they injected the insulin and it was successful. Um, and so we celebrate that in 2022, it will be 100 years since the first successful injection. We know in 2021, it's 100 years since the discovery of insulin, which is an unbelievable thing because prior to, to 1921, if you were diagnosed with diabetes, it was a death sentence. There was nothing they could do. Hospitals were full of people that just died within months. Um, and once insulin came into play, people could survive. So many organizations are celebrating 1920 or 2021, and so are we, but 2022 seemed like fitting because that's when it did, it was life altering for people. And so our initiative is to reach a million people to donate $22, um, to reach $22 million by 2022, so that Dr. Shapiro can move from mice to human trials. It's amazing. <laughs> I think we're all like, 
Okay, wow. this is doable. 20, 20, 20, 20 down, bucks. Like, yeah, 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 very doable. Me, this is doable. So it was, well, and it's grassroots. We are very, yeah. again, it's very grassroots. I'm the sole employee. I've always worked from home and I have a volunteer board of 14 who are not governance. They are active board members. Um, and so it's a mighty crew, but it's grassroots. And we were very cognizant of COVID when it hit, um, you know, in February, March, April in Canada. And so as all not-for-profits, we hit pause. We did not do anything to respect what was happening around the world. But we also realized that one of the things for COVID is the high risk factor is people who live with diabetes. And so this is a great opportunity to tell people that this pandemic affects every person who lives with diabetes around the world because they are more susceptible to complications if they get it. Not more susceptible to get COVID, but if they get it, we know that it is not gonna be an easy time for them. And so we knew it was a grassroots ask. And so even though people were struggling to ask for a $22 donation, probably wasn't a big stretch. And it's been fantastic. The, the support we've received around the world has been amazing. And so it was just that way we could do it. And when you say it, you know, we should have to reach a million people and you give $22. I mean, how hard oh. can it be? <laughs> oh, I just have to tell you, my birthday charity was, was Drift mm -hmm. Can and I raised $500. So Thank there. you very much. <laughs> That's awesome. Did you do yeah, it? Sorry. Did you do it? Did you do a Facebook fundraiser? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 So that's interesting. Those are fantastic. And yeah. that is a way for the actual individual to do that because Facebook covers all the costs yeah. for the charities. So a hundred percent of money raised on Facebook fundraisers comes directly to Drift Camp. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. So I had to keep explaining what it was for because nobody had heard of Drift Camp. So. Yeah. Which <laughs> anyway. is spread the word, right? That's yeah. how we yeah. keep our costs. So the, the unique thing about Drift Camp is, is that our goal is to get to 90-10. Um, which means 90% of all dollars raised go directly to research, which if you go to CRA and look up not-for-profits, not-for-profits struggle these days. A lot of admin costs, a lot of heavy um, top costs. So less goes to what they're actually trying to raise money for. So our goal is to get to 90-10 and we are close. Um, so even though we're growing, um, we're, we're, we're getting there with on the admin budget that we have. Um, and that's where the grassroots comes in, right? Is really looking at these ways. We don't spend any money on or a lot of money on marketing, advertising. It is by word of mouth and social media is fantastic for that. And this, so, yeah, go ahead, Lizette. Well, I was just going to say, so Gwen uh, did a, you know, fabulous thing and she did a, a Facebook a fundraiser, but besides Gwen's fundraiser, how does the average Joe donate? So they can go two places. They can go on www.driftcan, D-R-I-F-C-A-N.com, um, which is our um, general charity website. And, or you can go on to www.heading, H-E-A-D-I-N-G, to 2022.com and donate. If you go to heading to 2022, it goes within the initiative that we're doing. Um, and then all funds still are through DriftCan because DriftCan is the charity. Heading to 2022 is a committee and an initiative. So your tax receipt is issued from DriftCan. Um, but either place you can go to as well. Um, we now are set up in the United States. And so people can go onto our website and you can donate on the Canadian donate button or you can donate on the US um, button and people in the United States now get a tax receipt as well for anything over $20 they donate. Hmm. Oh, we were talking really um, yeah, earlier, Mel, and I mean, for me, we live with diabetes each and every day. I mean, over 20 years now of, and my husband's a pumper, so insulin dependent and, you know, considered a poster boy, does everything he's supposed to do, stay healthy. And, and you're right with COVID and taking into consideration the 55 age factor older, we know that statistically shows diabetics do have an expiration date a little earlier than most. Um, we'll call it as it is. So we're here in Ontario, you're in another province, but what can we do here in Ontario to have our government start moving in the right direction to make sure we get those grants, those funds out there and to work in a, a more positive collaboration? Um, because you're right, it affects all Canadians. It does affect all Canadians. And no matter where the research is done, um, it's going to reach everyone who lives. It's, 
If the cure comes from stem cell transplants, this is not going to stay in Alberta. This is going to be given out to the world, um, to all Canadians and everywhere else um, to have it. It is not a patent and it's not coming out to anybody. So it really is spreading the message and it really is having people advocate and talk to their government and talk to um, things like this and spread the message uh, because people don't understand what the First of all, what it takes to have diabetes or for a family, it's a family disease for sure. It affects everybody. Um, but the cost to our healthcare system, which, which boggles my mind that I know, and I mean now is, is a hard time in government um, with COVID and the money that's being put to, to the pandemic. And I get that. It's 100% needs to happen. But how did we get to a place where $17 billion a year in our federal government across the board covers for diabetes and no one funds it. Governments do not fund nope. diabetes research. Yet we have a pandemic that's come out and millions and millions of dollars have been put into finding a vaccine, which I think is fantastic, but that's eight months. And we've had a hundred years of trying to find for this disease and nothing happens. And I think it's because they see that with the technology, people can live a normal life. And I think that's just easier. And so for myself here, I've always been an advocate. So I guess I work for DriftCan, but obviously I live, eat and breathe this disease. And I volunteer as an advocate for other organizations in diabetes as well. And I represented our government. I meet with my MLA, I met my MLA every year. The guy knows my name by like heart. I now meet with my health minister on a regular basis and I have other families come with me. I go to question period, you know, I'm in there. And that's what we need to do as families across this country. Because I think people think that you have to be a big organization to make a difference, but you don't. You don't. It has to be the voice of the people who live it. Because if there's something about not-for-profit, whatever the disease is, it's always the story that tells. And it's always the connection to the people. Yep. And if our governments are doing their job by representing the people, then this is what they need to hear. Yeah. Very good point. point. <laughs> yeah. So I have another question. This might sound silly, but earlier you mentioned that, um, you know, Alberta is doing uh, that transplant or whatever, and BC and Quebec are doing it. Well, where's Ontario? Where, where are we on the list? So it's not a matter about being on this, it's about researchers in your province who want to be involved in it. And in Ontario, there is none that have stepped up. So they're all aware of what's there. The interesting thing is, the reason that BC and Quebec are now doing it is, there was two doctors that worked at the University of Alberta with Dr. Shapiro, and they moved to BC to the UBC, and the one moved to Quebec to work at McGill. And so they've moved the transplants there. So they were trained here, then they moved, and then they set it up there. And so they work with Dr. Shapiro on doing those transplants. I do know that the interesting thing is, is that patients that received the islet transplant prior to Alberta closing its borders, they're from, from all over Canada to Edmonton to be treated by Dr. Shapiro's team to have like a regular checkup. Some provinces are helping pay for that. I know in the province of Nova Scotia, we have many islet transplant patients there, and they are now funded by their government for their flight and hotel to get to Edmonton to have their annual checkup. However, the province at this point is not supporting to do the islet transplants, but again, they have to find the doctors who are willing to do that. And it's a big project. So if the physicians are not gonna be supported by their government, then it's not really it's probably mostly a money factor, I would have to say, because each transplant is seventy-five thousand dollars. Whoa! Yeah, yeah. and mul and for the islet transplants, multiple transplants to make it successful. So, majority of islet transplant patients have received two to three transplants in order to get enough islet cells. So, if you look at that, our government pays for three of those transplants. Usually at some point it reverses because the body still attacks because we haven't cured the disease. So then they have to have another one. Um, again, it's paid for. So it's quite, a, it's quite a process, but the longest living patient that's had an islet transplant is now 19 years diabetes free. So wow. they, live, they live essentially diabetes free once they get that transplant. So doesn't that just pay for itself then when it comes to what the government has to spend in? Right you know, 
hospitalization and all that stuff. Right. So the thing with the island transplant though is you have to have a qualification. And so just your average type one cannot qualify because they're healthy. So they can live a normal, healthy life. The transplant, that transplant is for people who do not feel their low blood sugars, who are at risk for harm to themselves, risk for going into a coma and risk for dying. And so that's why they qualify for it. My children would never qualify because they feel their low blood sugars. Their month, their, their monthly checkup is, is clear. And so for all intents and purposes, they're healthy, yeah. <laughs> which is great. <laughs> Yeah. Because if anybody's ever, have, ever had one of those lows and not, they're not detected, that's it, pretty scary. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. As I was telling you, my husband was like for a month, he was quite a number of twos and threes. Those numbers are scary. <laughs> and, uh, but he's got it better under control this month. So fingers crossed. But that's why I'm so interested in it because uh, not only am I a bit of a geek when it comes to anything to do with science and research, but it, it impacts your life and it, it means every one of us is impacted by it even if we don't have a loved one who has it yeah. just yeah. with our our health care dollars going to people end up with heart disease they end up with failing kidneys they end up with so many different things because of diabetes it's a very serious illness well imagine what our governments could do if 17 billion dollars was put back into the economy absolutely <laughs> Imagine what we could do with that money. If we Here's something it. else. <laughs> oh, some social programs would definitely be beneficial. Oh, yeah. We do. Yes. Yeah. Right? Uh, but yeah, Nikki, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the time here. And I'm, I apologize for being that person that needs to wrap up. But I mean, this has been such an educational um, conversation for myself. Because as I was mentioning um, earlier, I, I don't have anybody personally um, with um, type one or type two diabetes. So as you guys are talking, it almost feels like a second language when you're talking about some of the treatments, and some of the options, and it's such um, an important piece to be able to educate the community, um, educate the community on what is happening and what is diabetes and what resources do we have available to help people move in a more positive direction. So as I'm keeping an eye on the time, Melanie, is there any final thought that we should share with our viewers um, before we wrap up and keep in mind, we are going to share both those websites you mentioned earlier um, and your contact information for our viewers so they can check you out and share your information, hopefully on social media as well. So is there any final thoughts we can, we can mention to our viewers? You know, I think you hit the, the nail on the head by stating that um, it's really bringing awareness and education to people to understand what the disease is, what it means, and how it impacts not just the people who live with the disease, not just their families and friends that help support it, because it takes a village to take care of a type 1 or a type 2 for sure. And But for me, it's about making people understand that more people are touched by this disease than they realize, they just don't know it. And when the conversation starts, so things like this are fantastic because people watch and go, oh yeah, I think I did know somebody that used to give needles or, oh yeah, I saw that person in the restaurant. And that's maybe what they were doing was checking their blood sugar. Because I don't know how many times my kids got scowls when they'd have to take out the needle and give the injection and people going, what are yeah. you doing sitting there? And so, you know, that's not, a, it's not great, but it's not, it's not educated, it's not awareness because it is an invisible disease. So truly, I would like to just express my gratitude that you've had me on here. And to do things like this, this is what makes a difference. This is what Grassroots does. This is what helps people understand that there is a global pandemic of diabetes. And at the rate that it is growing is unbelievable that every three minutes, a Canadian is diagnosed with a form of diabetes. And we have to get this under control. And the only way to do that is to find a cure and support our researchers. And wouldn't it be amazing that a hundred years ago, it was a Canadian researcher who discovered insulin and sold the patent for a dollar so that he could give it to the world. And Banting and Best did that. And to think that not much more after a hundred years of the discovery of insulin, that it is another Canadian researcher who is on the way to finding a cure and to again give it to the world at no cost because that's what Canadian researchers do. And so there is nothing more than I can ask that as Canadians, please stand up and help us support our local researchers 
who are doing this and help us find the cure. $22 at a time. That's right. Every $22 counts. Whether you do it by a bake sale, you do it by a Facebook fundraiser, you go to our Canada Helps page, you can set up a fundraiser page on our Canada Helps page, um, any way to do that. But every $22 counts. For 2022. That's right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Melanie, for joining us That's today. Great. Um, very educational, very informative. Um, and it's just been a pleasure talking with you. And thank you for helping um, our community age in action. Thank you very much for having Thanks, me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Melanie. Take care. Thank you. You too. Merry Christmas, everybody. Yes, that's right. Yep. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. <laughs> yeah.